I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 120, a review of The Irishman, which my wife and I saw yesterday on Netflix. Today, by the way, in America is Thanksgiving Day. So we saw The Irishman yesterday when it debuted on Netflix. And I have to say, it's a three and a half hour movie. It was a real pleasure seeing it at home on Netflix rather than going out to the theater and sitting in a theater for three and a half hours. And here in New York City, at least, it's just playing in a few theaters. And it's part of the revolution in streaming that Netflix, which made this movie, put it on at the same time as it's been out in the uh, theater. So once upon a time, all you could get on television was either a made-for-television movie, which was never as good as the kind of movies you see in the theater, or maybe a movie that was a few years old. But times have really changed as far as how you can see movies because of Netflix and also Amazon Prime and Hulu. And I think that's a change for the better. Now, as to the movie, It's What It Is was an oft-repeated phrase in this story about who killed Jimmy Hoffa and how. And what this movie by Martin Scorsese certainly is is something extraordinary in the story it tells and in the way it was directed by Scorsese and acted by this trio of world-class brilliant actors, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Joe Pesci. And for that matter, everyone else in the movie was outstanding, too. Now, one big question in this story is how true is the tale that Frank Sharon tells us in the last days of his life. Part of this story is how Sharon, played by Robert De Niro, killed Joey Gallo in 1972 in Umberto's Clam House in New York City. Now, I live in New York City. I have never eaten in Umberto's Clam House in Little Italy in Manhattan, but I have several times in Umberto's other clam house up near Fordham University where I teach in Little Italy in the Bronx. Sadly, that closed a few years ago. I don't think anyone was ever shot there, but I guess it closed because it wasn't getting enough business. Who knows? But up until this movie, which is based on Charles Brandt's 2004 book, I Heard You Paint Houses, which I haven't read, I had thought that four other gunmen, not Sharon, had killed Gallo. You can check out the Wikipedia entry on this. I wasn't there, so I can't with certainty know who killed Gallo. But consider this. If Sharon did not kill Gallo, why should we believe that he killed Jimmy Hoffa? A somewhat lesser but still significant question is why Sharon's daughter Peggy had such deep misgivings about her father to the point of never talking to him again after Sharon presumably killed Hoffa. Why did she have those misgivings all those years? Why her and not her sisters? Now, based on the movie, The only answer I can think of is that Peggy had almost a sixth sense about her father. And that's not very satisfying as even a component of such a momentous story. There was the scene of Sharon crushing the hand of the man who pushed Peggy in the grocery store when she was a little girl with Peggy looking on as Sharon crushed the guy's hand. And yeah, Peggy was horrified. But I don't know, this doesn't quite seem sufficient for her lifelong growing abhorrence of her father. But there is an old saying to the effect of, though it may not be true, it's still a great story. And that's manifestly the case for the Irishman. And a lot of the story does make a perfect kind of sense, 
Why did Russ, played by Joe Pesci, talk Sharon into killing Hoffa? It was to protect both Sharon and Russ, as Russ later explains to Sharon. Because if someone else had killed Hoffa, the mob would have been concerned, very concerned, that Sharon might seek some vengeance. And as we heard early in the movie, being very concerned is a state that everyone in this story takes very seriously. But with Sharon pulling the trigger on Hoffa, the mob didn't have to be concerned about vengeance because who could Sharon take vengeance on? Himself? As for the acting, Tour de Force just doesn't do justice to these three main players. De Niro was absolutely masterful in every scene in voice and expression. Pacino as Hoffa was the same. The way he says phone in his first conversation as Hoffa with Sharon. If only by phone, phone, I can't even do it. But the way that Pacino says that, it's just the right tone to establish Jimmy Hoffa as a character in a world all his own. By phone. And the same is true for Pacino's expression when Russ, played by Joe Pesci, tells Hoffa that he may not be showing proper, quote, appreciation, unquote. Pesci delivers that line with a quiet strength and a mob wisdom that typifies his character. All three acted their characters over decades of time, and the de-aging process enhanced this, and that de-aging process has certainly been praised by many critics, and with due justification. But I have to say their acting, as well as the de-aging, brought home this change over time. They acted their younger, middle-aged, and older roles just perfectly. So my humble recommendation. All three actors should split the Oscar for best performance this year. And the supporting roles in the movie, as I mentioned, were also fabulous. They're probably too short for supporting Oscars, but they were all memorable, ranging from Jesse Plemons as Hoffa's son Chucky to Harvey Keitel as mobster Angelo Bruno. And I also have to give a shout-out regarding the music. I used to sing in the still of the night by the Five Satins with my doo group, Little Levy and the Emeralds, in the late 50s. Yeah, I was just a kid back then. And it was great to hear that song at least three times in The Irishman. And the other music was right on key for the movie, too. Scorsese is already lauded for Goodfellas and Casino, movies about the mob that were so good, they come in just below the Godfather trilogy, in my opinion. I put The Irishman just above those two. And I'm going to keep thinking about it. The Light on Light Through podcast... Hey, I hope you enjoyed this review of The Irishman, a really fabulous movie. I'll be back here soon with another podcast, maybe a review, maybe something else. In the meantime, enjoy. Athens, 2042 A.D. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left, again, into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. 
You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for 